let's start this morning off on an utterly optimistic note, shall we? Let's contemplate death. Yeah? <laughs> okay. So let's think about how we die and how we died a good hundred years ago and how we die now. If you look at the reasons that killed us a hundred years ago, well, they're out there for you. This is a New England Journal of Medicine um, analysis of the US. And you can see that while this holds true for most high income group countries, this is also true to a certain extent for low income group countries. Across the board and across the world, we have dramatically improved life expectancy. We live a lot longer than anyone did in the 1900s. Yeah? And certainly more than the 1800s. So over time, biomedical science must have done something pretty dramatic for us to live as long as we do. This is certainly true for India. If you look at India pre-independence and India of today, we live a lot longer than our forefathers did. Life expectancy has dramatically improved. And why is that the case? It's because over the last 100 years, biomedical science has done something pretty dramatic about grappling with infectious disease. If you looked at a headline a good 100 years ago, or perhaps even more, it might not be surprising to say that a country, or a city, or a place was grappling with plague, was dying because of sepsis, and bubonic plague would not have been unusual in a city like Mumbai. And today, we do not see this on our headlines. <coughs> And so we know that over the last 100 years, the reasons that kill us are pretty dramatically different. The last century has been a century in which infectious disease has largely been grappled with pretty successfully. So what is killing us today then? What is it that we will die of and our children will die of and the next generation is likely to die of? The next generation will likely die of what are called non-communicable or lifestyle diseases. That's true across the board, heart disease, cardiovascular dysfunction, stroke, all of these are the diseases, the top diseases that we are likely to die of in this century and in this time. So then let's think about this. If this is true across the board and certainly across high income and low income group countries, while we still have a battle to fight with infectious disease, malaria and tuberculosis being two of the major ones, over the next 50 years, I hope, that across the board, infectious disease will largely have been grappled with. If then that is the case, we will be dealing with lifestyle disorders. What are lifestyle disorders and why are they given that catchphrase, lifestyle disorder? Lifestyle refers to diet, it refers to changes in our environment, it refers to how much we exercise and what we do with ourselves, but it also refers to one common theme. It refers to how we grapple with stress. Stress is a central theme across all of these disorders. Stress is an exacerbating or a worsening factor, and in certain cases, is it, a, it is a precipitating or a responsible primary factor. So stress, then, is something that is responsible for determining how well we will live and how we may die. Okay? So how do you define a term like stress? Stress is a tough term to define. It's tough for the layman. It's certainly tough for biomedical science. So let's think about stress and let's attempt to define it. Stress then is something that pus puts the normal functioning of your body under change. Homeostatic balance is disrupted. That means normal functioning of your body has been put awry. Okay? So in a sense, you can now think of the fact that many things would qualify as stress. Extreme cold, extreme heat would pr put your body under stress, certainly. Starving and perhaps eating a way bit too much also puts your body under stress. But whether or not somebody liked your post on Facebook and whether your Twitter tweet got a response or not may also put you under stress. So now you begin to realize that stress is a catch-all phrase for anything that threatens the normal functioning of your body and body includes your brain. Okay? So all of us mount a concerted attempt to bring our stress ba body back to normal when we face a stress. Each and every one of us in this room, if we were given a quick mental math test to do, would give us a short and quick spike in cortisol in your blood, because none of us really like doing mental math under rapid timeline, time-bound conditions. But we would all have a very quick response, and hopefully it would be terminated, because it was a short, short test. 
So then each and, each and every one of us in this room within our brain has the ability to mount a stress response and to turn off a stress. Why do we have this? Because evolution has selected for us a wonderful stress response pathway, one which we've inherited from our ancestors. This beautiful stress response pathway is such that it allows you to quickly recognize a stress, rapidly switch on a stress response, and then decide whether you're going to stay to fight or decide whether at this moment perhaps the best thing to do is flee. Okay? So our stress response pathways are beautifully engineered. But they were really beautifully engineered for those times in which we were out there in the wilderness deciding how we were going to find our next meal. They were beautifully there for us to help to escape becoming somebody else's meal. So this was a really beautiful system designed for that. But perhaps it was not as well designed for a chronic stress of like a flood or a famine. And certainly it was not well designed for being chronically switched off when you didn't feel like waking up and going to work every day because you had a lousy relationship with your boss. Certainly not such a good one for worrying about whether your latest tweet or whether your latest Facebook post was going to get you socially isolated or socially popular. And yet we use the same pathway to be switched on over and over again, whether it was those acute physical stressors or those chronic psychological and social stressors. So we all have the same stress response pathway. And yet I've just told you that the way we grapple with the way we live and the way we die will determine will be determined to a large extent by how we cope with stress. Is it true that all of you in this room cope differently with stress? I think so. Anecdotally, we know that this is certainly true. So clearly, each of us in this room copes with stress differently. And I will go so far as to say that your stress and my stress is likely to be different. I'm sure there will be someone in this room who will happily tie a rope around their ankles and jump off a bridge and call it entertainment. I'm sure there are also those of us in this room who will view this as tantamount to death. And this is horrendous as a thought. The idea that you would willingly bounce off a building or a bridge and dangle from a rope and consider this entertainment. That's my idea of a horrendous idea of stress, right? So stress varies from person to person. And yet I am telling you, each of you have the same architecture. We use the very same blueprint we use the very, very same blueprint to make our stress pathway. You and I and everyone else, every vertebrate out there has the same broad stress response pathway. You and I have a hypothalamus at the base of our brain, which is the first place that does the alarm bells of stress. Right? That receives in information from diverse parts of the brain, which receives and integrates information from the body. So you have your hypothalamus which communicates to your pituitary, which tells your adrenal glands, you know what, I've just experienced a stress. I'm going to throw my stress hormones out into my body so that my muscles, my digestive system, my reproductive organs, my entire body is ready and prepped to bring my body back to normal and to cope with this stress. So if we all have the very same blueprint, then why is your response and my response to stress not identical? We, we all would respond to stress by increasing stress hormone secretion. And yet, each, of one, each one of us will choose that stress to be potentially different. Each of us may switch off our stress response very differently. And there will be those of us who are outstanding at coping with stress, stress, and there will be those of us who are really lousy at coping with stress. Despite having had the very same underlying architecture. And so let's think about this like an analogy. Let's think about a building. So an architect puts together a building, multiple flats, one above the other, the exact same blueprint over and over again. And yet, when people come to reside in it and make their own homes, as you walk into home after home, that home is quite different. Despite the walls and the kitchen and the bathroom and everything else being located in a specific space, you still have a characteristic signature of your home, much the same way your brain is using the architectural blueprint of your genetic pool to eventually generate the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis. So every single one of us has a hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis. And yet the way we tweak it is very, very different. The way we use it is very, very different. And our ability to switch it on appropriately and switch it off, even more important, to switch it off appropriately is quite distinct. 
and that is where we come to the idea that we can educate this blueprint. This blueprint is what we were born with and yet we start educating it right in our intrauterine life itself. Experience has the ability to educate this very same blueprint to eventually determine how you will fine tune and tweak your stress response pathway. If experience can actually tweak your stress response circuitry, then does it do this across your entire life? To some extent it does. But there are windows in which it has the most dramatic effect on the stress response axis and those windows are called critical windows. They are critical windows in which experience has the most powerful effect on this brain controlled axis. Those windows are early windows. What do I mean by early? We do not have a really good clue for human beings. We have a fairly reasonable idea for our cousins, the non-human primates and a much better idea for rodents. We know that early means the first few years of life. We know that it means likely up to adolescence. So we are guessing when we say for human beings, but we think it is likely to be the first 10 to 12 years of life. Intrauterine onwards till the first 10 to 12 years of life. This is when experience will have the most dramatic effect on your stress response pathways. Educating and tweaking them to decide how best they may be optimally used across the lifespan. So that early window really, really matters. I do not want you to leave with the idea that later on does not matter and it is all over after 12. That is not the case. Experience continues to matter and that is what we know this from anecdotal experience we know people can surmount horrendous early life circumstances and have it within them and so experience does have that power to rewire the brain over and over again. But that early window is perhaps <coughs> the most critical. And what is going on in that early window? How is it that life and experience is actually changing the brain? Experience is a dramatic brain changer and early experience perhaps more so than any other experience is a huge brain changer. You start with this circuit that you have laid out and then you decide what you want to do with that circuit. In a sense think about it like this. You set up a blueprint and now that blueprint is going to look around the world and see what it sees around itself and decide I am going to use what I experienced to predict what I am likely to see for the rest of my life. So negative experience and strong negative experience preps the circuit to say you know what I better have a really active stress axis because I am going to need it across my life. And so you prime a hyper reactive stress response pathway one that gets activated very quickly and unfortunately sometimes does not get switched off as well. This means your brain and your body will be bathed with high levels of stress hormones because you have engineered a very reactive hyper responsive stress response axis. On the other hand learning that it is unlikely we are ever going to go to a world where we have a stress free existence. But learning that we have control over stress appears to be most critical and learning that early learning that we have an ability to change our circumstances and override a stressful event is perhaps the most key learning that happens in that first decade. Because when that happens you have the ability to control your stress response axis and perhaps most profoundly know how to switch it off and to make sure that you can say this is not the time I want this pa pathway to be very very active. And the way this happens and the way the brain does this is by actually changing the very neurons that control the stress response pathway. Early experience determines how many neurons are going to be dedicated in higher circuits to talking to that stress response pathway. Determines the degree of neurons that are there and also the nature of connections and the strength of connections between these neurons to the stress response pathway. So high quality enriched experience early gives you powerful connections that allow you to switch off your stress response pathway quickly, rapidly and also to have the ability to not switch it off, switch it on inappropriately. So you do this by changing the numbers of neurons. You do this in other ways by changing the connections between neurons. But you also do it in a third way. You do it by changing what proteins are expressed within those neurons in these circuits. And how do you express these proteins? Proteins are made by genes that make mRNA which eventually make protein. Experience has the power to decide how much you are going to make of a particular protein. And if that protein is a protein that responds to stress related pathways then it becomes a critically important protein. 
And how does it do this? This is a novel concept that is going to revolutionize our time. If the last century was about genetics, the next century is going to be about epigenetics. It is how experience educates your DNA to decide what you will express from the genes that you have, how much you will express your genes, and how much of that will become protein. And in this video from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, you can see that here you have an expressed gene, and genes are so genes which are made of DNA are wrapped around proteins which have a lot of different chemical tags and signatures. One such chemical tag could be a methyl group. Experience has the ability to change the amount of methylation near specific genes, and by doing that, attract different enzymes or cause them to be taken away such that you can control the gene to determine how much of the protein will be made by that particular gene. Why is this important? This is important because life experience then has the ability to directly regulate how you will make protein from genes that matter and that regulate your stress response pathway. And so, Let's wonder about why this matters to each one of us in this room. Why is this even remotely relevant? We started by saying, how are we going to die over the next 100 years? Well, we're going to die of stress-related diseases, which means that the big challenge of our times is how do we make individuals become outstanding individuals at coping with stress? It is that which will determine our quality of life, and it is that which biomedical science, legislators, educators, parents, communities, and societies at large will have to grapple with. How do we ensure that the complex society that we are sure we are going to leave behind for the next generation is one that they can handle and cope with? By ensuring that we provide them the environments in which they have the best stress coping pathways possible. Here, this is relevant to each and every one of you. It's relevant to you as a parent. It's relevant to you as a grandparent. It's relevant to you if you're an educator. It's relevant to you if you're a friend. It's relevant to you if you're a member of the voting public because legislators have to think about what sort of environment are we providing to individuals in that very critical early window which will determine their capacity to cope with stress as they go on to become full-fledged adults and take on the complex society that we are going to leave behind for them. Thank you.